Lego 2K Drive. Welcome to LEGO 2K Drive. The year is 2023, and a new LEGO racing game developed by Visual Concepts in partnership with the LEGO Group, a game I've been waiting for for 22 years, has finally arrived. But it's impossible for me to talk about LEGO 2K Drive without talking about the LEGO racing games that preceded it, because really, my thoughts of LEGO 2K Drive can be distilled to... It's fine. And so instead of writing several thousands of words to say just that, don't look at the runtime, which would have bored us both to tears, this video has become much less of a proper review of LEGO 2K Drive, and instead a discussion of the cultural context of LEGO 2K Drive's design and development, and how 2K Drive fits into the long history of LEGO games, namely those of the LEGO Racing series. And so, with that in mind, let me take you back to the halcyon days of the 1990s. The movies were big, the jeans were bigger, and the LEGO group was just beginning to dip their toes into the world of video game development. So there was a bit of a fear in the LEGO group that their physical sets were headed towards an inevitable obsolescence at the hands of popular brands like Pokemon and Super Mario, but it was these fears that led to the development of the highly experimental LEGO Fun to Build in 1995 and the cult classic LEGO Island in 1997. But we're most interested in what happened two years later in 1999, the release of LEGO Racers. Developed by Illinois-based High Voltage Software, LEGO Racers was the first of many racing games to come from the LEGO group, and was the first LEGO game I'd ever played. I played that game until its wheels fell off. There was definitely a time in my childhood where I could have hand-drawn every turn of every track in that game. So you can imagine my excitement when I discovered they'd made a sequel. It's a bit disingenuous to say they made a sequel. Instead, I should say that the LEGO Group published a sequel. High Voltage Software was not brought back to develop LEGO Racers 2. That torch was shipped across the pond to British developers' attention to detail. Attention to detail would end up developing two LEGO-themed racing games, though only one would bear the LEGO Racers title. Their second LEGO Racer was 2002's Drome Racers, and would be their last game before the studio's closure in August of 2003. And like LEGO Racers before it, I played LEGO Racers 2 until I literally could not play it anymore. And that is not a joke, I got Carpal Tunnel playing LEGO Racers 2. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is something I've spoken about on in much greater detail in another video, a history of cancelled LEGO Racers 3 projects, which I'll link below and summarize here just so we're all on the same page. Before Attention to Detail's 2003 closure, they were working on a proper third LEGO Racers game, but the project was cancelled after what one dev called, quote, substantial development effort. But this wouldn't be the last time the LEGO Group would try to continue the legacy of LEGO Racers. In 2004, less than a year after ATD's closure, ads appeared in a European LEGO catalog marketing a game called LEGO Racers CC. This game was never released. In 2007, NetDevil, developers of the ill-fated LEGO MMO LEGO Universe, announced a web-based LEGO Racers game planned for release in the first quarter of 2008, but this too never saw the light of day. However, that same year, Hands On Mobile developed a mobile LEGO Racers game, though it bore greater gameplay similarities to something like Rock and Roll Racers or even LEGO Stunt Rally than to original LEGO Racers. In 2009, ads appeared on physical LEGO boxes for something called LEGO Racers The Video Game, and though this too never came to fruition, it actually had some amount of development time behind it, as screenshots and videos of the game ended up leaking onto the web via the online portfolio of one of the game's artists. And finally, NetDevil, even though their browser-based Racers game was never released, did add a racing mode into LEGO Universe, which was, for a time, the closest any of us could ever get to a proper Racers sequel. But when LEGO Universe shut down in early 2012, LEGO Racers seemed to die with it.
Despite their issues getting a new LEGO racing game out the door, LEGO hadn't entirely moved out of the sphere of video games. Since 2005, the LEGO group has been in a rather prosperous relationship with UK-based TT Games, which continued to crank out LEGO-branded titles at a frantic pace, developing and publishing over 20 LEGO games between 2005 and 2022, sometimes publishing as many as three LEGO games a year. Most of these games were third-person action adventures of one form or another, but so long as TT was making making LEGO games, the idea that they might one day branch out and make a racing game never truly died. However, it wasn't until June of 2019 that rumors of a LEGO Racers reboot would truly bubble back to the forefront of public consciousness, when it was announced that a LEGO Speed Champions DLC was coming to Forza Horizon 4. But this ended up being little more than a one-time curiosity, though they did just announce, as of the time of writing this section of the script, that a special LEGO-themed multiplayer mode was being added as a limited-time event to Gameloft's Asphalt 9. And so, the Speed Champions Forza DLC was all we really had until February of 2022, when Video Games Chronicle revealed that video game publisher 2K had secured a license to make multiple LEGO-branded sports games, one of which would supposedly be an open-world driving game developed by Visual Concepts. Details about the exact nature and timing of the partnership are still a bit muddy, but here's how LEGO Games' head of licensing, Kate Bryant, describes how 2K and Visual Concepts convinced the LEGO group to let them take a swing at a new racing game. It wasn't only a commitment to making something incredible, but to make an incredible thing that's super, super Lego-y. There was a little bit of that moment where it was, okay, I'm already excited hearing these guys talking in the room about what they think they can be making, and how they see the Lego brand showing up in games in a way that's super AAA feeling, ambitious, but also with that commitment to being funny and feeling super accessible. When Visual Concepts first came to us with the idea of LEGO 2K Drive, the passion they showed in what this could be, it wasn't, hey look, we can make a cool kart racer. It was something so drenched in an understanding and love of the LEGO brand and what would make it a game you would keep coming back to in the long term. It's unclear how long after this initial pitch, development of LEGO 2K Drive actually began, but according to an interview with Visual Concepts creative director Brian Silva prior to the game's 2023 release, the game had, at that time, been in development for four or five years. Through some additional deduction, art director Emmanuel Valdez told Brick Fanatics that he joined Visual Concepts roughly six months into 2K Drive's development, which means that, according to Valdez LinkedIn, we can assume proper development of 2K Drive began in late 2018. Then, in May of 2023, it finally arrived. Okay, and before we go any further, I wanted to insert this smallest of asides here, since those of you who've maybe watched my first weekend impressions video and are watching this video here might have noticed some differences visually between the two. In the first weekend of 2K Drive's release, I played it on the Nintendo Switch, since I figured it was probably a game with which I'd like to have some portability in playing it. I've long claimed that original flavor racers would be perfect for the Switch, in the same kind of casual way that Mario Kart is. And with that philosophical nugget launched in my brain, I bought 2K Drive for Switch and played it through to the first big championship race on that platform. And then I cut the impressions video, and it was whilst editing that video that I was reminded of the trailers for the game itself, and I was kind of shocked at the difference in visual quality between my docked Switch gameplay and the gameplay capture in the trailers. I knew intellectually when I bought 2K Drive on the Switch that because the Switch is not nearly as powerful a system as a PlayStation or an Xbox, that visual concepts would have needed to make some amount of technical concessions to get it onto the Switch. And concess they did. It's difficult to isolate exactly what concessions were made to get this game onto the Switch because they're seemingly made everywhere. Lighting, textures, particle effects, and even, this was the most surprising to me when I finally played the game on Xbox, fewer racers on each track. On the Switch, each race takes place between six competitors, but on Xbox, it's eight. Now, as an aside within this aside, I do not think that visual fidelity or technical complexity are what makes a game great. It'll probably be old news by the time this video comes out, but just this week, 
as of the time of writing this sentence in the script, there's been a clip making the rounds on Twitter wherein some jabroni who got an early hands-on preview of Armored Core 6 claimed that FromSoft was falling behind in the technical arms race of AAA game developers by not upgrading from their proprietary engine to something like Unreal 5, even going so far as to claim that the quote, graphics in Elden Ring, quote, suffered because the game wasn't made exclusively for next-gen hardware, which is, in conjunction with the discussion of Armored Core's art direction, maybe the most asinine gamer take I've heard this year. And when, in 2024, you take into account that something as gorgeous as Helldivers 2 was made on objectively outdated and unsupported software, come on. To sub aside even further, game engines are just tools with which to make games, like cameras are for movies and TV shows. Not every award-winning film is shot on the same camera. Mad Max Fury Road was shot on the Aerie Alexa, A Hidden Life was shot on Red, Tangerine was shot on a couple of iPhones. No one in their right mind would look at the Mona Lisa and say, yeah, this is good, but it would be better if it were painted on canvas instead of wood. To claim that Armored Core needs to be made on one engine instead of another is deeply ignorant of not only game development, but of creative processes more generally. I've shot shorts on big, chunky Panasonic cameras, tiny mini-DV JVC cameras, the Canon C300, Canon T3i, and those impressions videos I mentioned earlier were shot on the Canon C100. The camera used has almost no bearing on the final quality of a movie or show, just as a game engine has little to no bearing on the final quality of a game. And navigating then back to my original point, 2K Drive's visual quality on the Switch does not make it any worse of a game than its PlayStation and Xbox counterparts. I had just as much fun playing the game on Switch as I did on Xbox. The load times were longer, sure, and yes, there were more opponents in each race on Xbox, but beyond that, it is the same game. Just a little flatter and chunkier. If you want to buy the game on Switch, don't let anyone talk you out of it. But I know these are the kind of things that people in this sphere of criticism like to get hung up on, so I felt like I needed to speak on it for however long as the supposedly brief segment was meant to be. Back to the main video. So if you've made it this far, but haven't actually played LEGO 2K Drive, let's talk a bit about what it's all about. Let's start with the single player mode. Like the previous two LEGO racing games, LEGO 2K Drive has a story, though a far more robust one than LEGO Racers 1 or 2. Our story begins with the reveal that you are an amazing racer and are seeking out the Sky Trophy, which can be earned by competing in and winning the Sky Cup Grand Prix. Unfortunately, even though you're already an awesome, super fast driver, you're a rookie in this world and will need to defeat a string of skilled rivals culminating in a face-off against the undefeated champion of the Sky Cup Grand Prix, Shadow Z. Seeing your predicament, veteran racer Clutch Racington takes you under his wing and helps hone your skills in Turbo Acres, the tutorial world of 2K Drive's now five open world areas. And it's here you'll get your first taste of what this game's racing is like. LEGO 2K Drive follows in the footsteps of myriad other open world racers, as well as directly in the footsteps of its immediate predecessor, LEGO Racers 2, in that nearly all of its tracks are just cordoned off bits of the open world, with the exception of the championship races and a handful of space-themed races added within the fourth drive pass, which all take place within custom environments you cannot access at any other point. In Turbo Acres, you'll get to know the different traversal mechanisms of your car, the boost, the jump, and the quick turn, as well as dabble in the many different different roulette wheel mystery box power-ups you'll be able to deploy during your races. And once you've completed your training in Turbo Acres, you'll head out to Big Butte, where the game really opens up. Big Butte, and all the open world areas after it, is exponentially larger than Turbo Acres, and will be the moment where you really get to grapple with 2K Drive as a whole. The flow of gameplay through this and the rest of the open areas goes like this. Find a race, explore the world on your way to it, compete in any events you'd like to on your way to that race, arrive at the race, win the race, collect rewards, rinse, repeat, until you've done that loop enough to earn your way into that area's championship race. Beat the championship race to move on to the next open world area. Throughout these moments, you'll get some extra motivation from Clutch, as well as get a few fly-on-the-wall peeks into Shadow Z's team's garage, where we'll learn much more about his less-than-fair driving strategies. Once you defeat all the challengers in Big Butte, Prospecto Valley, and Hauntsboro, you'll get to challenge Shadow Z for the Sky Trophy. And I'm sorry, another brief aside here. 
if you come to LEGO 2K Drive with the expectation you'll be able to build your own custom racer, you will be disappointed. Unlike the two previous mainline LEGO racing games, all the drivers in 2K Drive are prefab and actually classified as pieces in the garage. What this means is that you can get really creative with how you build your custom vehicles, either by placing your driver in a really weird place or by not including them at all if you want to design a car that wouldn't properly fit a minifigure. But I think that by not allowing players to make their own custom minifig, it does distance the narrative ever so slightly from the you are the best racer ever idea because you aren't. The best racer ever is whichever minifig you've chosen. It's Papa Briccolini, and he's taking the trophy back to LEGO Island. And that is what LEGO 2K Drive is like as a single-player experience. But for those seeking online thrills, there's definitely stuff in 2K Drive for you to enjoy. There's normal online racing you can do with friends or strangers, all taking place on tracks from the story mode, and then two more arcadey multiplayer modes, Brick Brawl and Goal Carts. Brick Brawl is akin to the battle modes in Mario Kart, and Goal Karts is quite clearly a legally distinct Rocket League. And all that is fun. Some bits definitely more than others. Track highlights include the bold, seemingly Hydro Thunder-inspired Grand Brick Arena in Big Butte, and all the space-themed tracks in Stargaze Summit. I was actually pretty far into writing this review when those tracks were added, and frankly I was shocked at how fun and inventive they were compared to everything that had come before. Taking aesthetic inspiration from Rocket Racer Run in LEGO Racers and a bit of the Vertigo Loop track in LEGO Universe, these space courses are fantastic. Not only are they more creatively designed than previous races, but because they're in space they have a, a fun low gravity quirk, meaning you can do a lot of really creative traversal to take the lead over your opponents. And maybe it was that I'd spent basically a whole year with all the other stuff, but these courses were such a breath of fresh air that I found myself wishing the whole game were like this. My dream, ever since LEGO Racers in 1999, has basically just been for LEGO Mario Kart, at least as far as tracks were concerned. I still want custom racers, I want custom cars, but I want to play curated, meticulously designed circuits in fun, memorable Grand Prix. But that is, unfortunately, just not what LEGO 2K Drive is, and it's not what LEGO 2K Drive wants to be. We can understand intellectually that LEGO 2K Drive could have been that, as 1999's LEGO Racers was, and it could be just as good, if not better, than it is now. But if we're honest with ourselves, it never could have been a direct mechanical sequel to LEGO Racers. I'd like to explore then, nestled within the design of 2K Drive, the interesting tension at the heart of this game. Because from my perspective, LEGO 2K Drive seems to be pulled between its offline single-player mode and all the online microtransaction stuff packed in all around it. The single-player mode is dense and packed with stuff to do, but even so has to cater to the theoretical online player. It can't just be a purely single-player mode within a game that has these online elements. One of the most important things that I like to impart is it's not LEGO Racers. It's not LEGO Racing. It's LEGO Drive. We call it Drive for a reason. It's about driving. It's not solely about racing. It's so much more than racing. I'd like to talk for a moment about an excellent video I watched recently that was keenly important in solidifying my thoughts for this section of the video. The video is one from Tin Sensei titled, LEGO Racers Can't Be Made Today. One of the points that Tin makes in that video that didn't really click with me until I heard it said aloud is that 1999's LEGO Racers was primarily a single player game as opposed to other contemporaneous games like Mario Kart, which were intended to be multiplayer experiences. Mario Kart had four-player split-screen, LEGO Racers only had two-player split-screen, and the Versus mode in which it was available wasn't even playable right out of the box. But perhaps the most damning evidence of LEGO Racers' single-player bias is its iconic brick-based power-up system. LEGO Racers' tactical brick-upgrading power-up system is wildly unbalanced, and explicitly favors the lead player. Mario Kart's mystery box items, on the other hand, allow for a much more even competitive experience. The lead players will typically only be provided with defensive power-ups, or simple offensive items that allow them to remain competitive with one another, while competitors further back in the pack will get access to exponentially more powerful offensive items that can help them claw their way back up the leaderboard. 
Meanwhile, in LEGO Racers, the power-up selection is much more deliberate. Four sets of colored bricks represent four power-up archetypes. Collecting the colored brick gives you access to the base ability, and collecting white bricks upgrades said ability. Collect three white bricks to max out the colored brick. Deploying a barrage of missiles or a high-powered shield that causes other players to spin out makes for a thrilling single-player experience, but a much more uneven multiplayer one, especially considering the king of LEGO Racer's power-ups, the warp. Here is where the bias toward the lead player becomes most clear. The placement of LEGO Racer's power-ups is never random. Once you learn the placement of the bricks around the track, you'll be able to optimize your path through the course to seek out exactly what bricks you want. And in the case of the green bricks, which ratchet up in power from a simple boost to the whiplash-inducing lightspeed warp, being the first person to claim that brick gives you an unrelenting advantage. Whereas Mario Kart will offer a boon to the last place player and give them a blue shell to seek out the lead player, thus theoretically evening the playing field, LEGO Racers allows the lead player to scoop up these most powerful bricks, rip open a seam in space-time, rocket them even further into first place, where they can continue to collect the best bricks before anyone else can get them, rinse, repeat, spam, cheese, whoops, you just lapped the last place racer, and now you won the race. And I can remember feeling this imbalance when my brother and I played split-screen on LEGO Racers. The outcome of basically every race came down to who got the first warp, because once that happened, only the absolute most catastrophic of driving errors could possibly allow anyone to catch up with you. But this wasn't the only design difference noted in Tin Sensei's analysis. As part of LEGO Racer's single-player focus, there is an added synergy between the power-up system and the discoverable shortcuts in each level. Some shortcuts can only be accessed by using certain items, so knowing and remembering where that specific colored brick can be found is key to successfully conquering each track. And like the power-ups themselves, the ability to use items to access specific shortcuts only serves to widen the theoretical gap between the first and last player, because while some shortcuts stay open once you've found them, others open and close, meaning that if you grab the item needed to get in before your opponent, they'll need to go the long way. 2K Drive has no such design. In fact, the word I'd use for how most of the races in 2K Drive play out is pandemonium. Items are doled out liberally, and nearly all of them are offensive, meaning there is almost always someone firing or exploding something in your direction. So while there are those amongst us who've looked at the landscape of modern racing games, especially arcade racers like LEGO 2K Drive, and wondered, why don't they just do what they did in 1999? Well, that's not what the market is looking for with racing games right now. And so while the racing and power-up systems of LEGO Racers are just as wildly fun today as they were 25 years ago, they simply would not make for a fun multiplayer experience. Mario Kart cracked the code of the multiplayer kart racer power-up economy years prior to original LEGO Racers, and so nearly all kart racers since have decided that what isn't broke isn't worth fixing. And that's why LEGO 2K Drive has slot machine power-ups in most instances, instead of a tactical brick select system. The randomized grab bag represents the most democratic form of multiplayer power-up distribution. And it feels like nearly every big-budget game these days, and even plenty of mid-budget and indies, are designed with primarily multiplayer in mind. And LEGO 2K Drive is, as we've shown, no exception. Even the story mode, which would ostensibly be just a single-player mode in most other games, can be played split-screen, which Visual Concepts conceived as a vitally important component of the story mode's design. We thought that it was really important because this is the type of game where, you know, siblings will want to sit on the couch and play together. Or, you know, a dad and his daughter. Having that couch play for races is awesome, but having couch multiplayer for the entire story mode, I think, is a step beyond. So for better or for worse, we'll probably never again get a LEGO racing game like LEGO Racers. At least not until gaming trends dramatically change. That said, those design choices do not mean the game isn't fun. The stuff that is fun 
is fun. But even so, much of the open world specific content, the quests, the on the go events, the little random items hidden all over the map, all end up feeling fairly superfluous to the holistic experience of 2K Drive. In part, because in nearly all instances, competing said event doesn't meaningfully progress the game. Yes, you'll gain XP from these open world activities, which will rank up your license to allow you access to higher difficulty versions of each race, but almost everything else you'll unlock is cosmetic, or currency to buy cosmetics. Contrast this with LEGO Racers 2, where competing events in the open world actually allowed you to upgrade your vehicle's speed, handling, or defense. In LEGO 2K Drive, these stats are available in prefab stat collections that you can select for your custom vehicles, or will come intrinsic to each of the game's other unlockable vehicles. And in a couple of instances, these open world events actually serve as a kind of grind fest. As previously stated, you can get XP from these events to level up your license, and in a few key moments of the main story, the next set of races you'll need to complete require you to have a certain level of license, A, B, or C, and it's unlikely you'll already be at that level when you reach that point. And so one of the easiest ways to get there is just to power through the open world activities. Now I know all this I've just said sounds like it runs counter to what I said that the open world doesn't meaningfully progress the game, since game progress is functionally locked behind exploring and completing tasks in the open world, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the core thread of LEGO 2K Drive would be just as fun without the grind of open world completion. But again, the game I'd pictured in my head since 2001 and the game that the devs at Visual Concepts wanted to make in 2023 were two entirely different things. We wanted the game to be a full experience, not just racetracks and vehicles. Driving is at the heart of the game. You race, but you also have challenges, mini games, quests, exploration, and collections. The open world was very important to us as well to give it more of a Lego creative sense to it, where you feel like you're playing with Lego when you play the game. Or as 2K Drive design director David Mishka said, One of the great things about the game, still to this day, is that it keeps inspiring us to create new content. And the thing is, we're not stuck into, oh, it's going to be a race. It's going to be like this very specific type of content. We're not shackled by that. We can think of very kooky things to do because we're not limited. Half of the ideas come from thinking about it on paper and the other half is we're playing and we go, wouldn't it be cool to do this here? And then it becomes a reality. As our creative director, Brian Silva keeps telling us, the game tells you what it wants to be. And in this case, the game kept on whispering in our ears like, what about this? What about that? Still to this day, even though we're supposed to be done. So while it may seem and feel to me like all this superfluous open world stuff in the single player mode feels unnecessary to the core allure of 2K Drive, all that really tells me is that I'm not the target of this particular game. And I knew that even before ever playing 2K Drive, because I'm 30. And despite the fact that the LEGO Group has spent the last few years leaning more heavily into designing physical sets for its adult fans, its games are still broadly targeted to younger demographics. And so while I might desire a more focused and refined racing game experience, I can understand that a younger player might very well enjoy this smorgasbord of things to do in this brightly colored, frenetic driving game. And yet, here is our second point of tension within 2K Drive. It's packed to the gills with microtransaction nonsense, the success of which, if this game is truly intended for a younger audience, would hinge on whether or not the adults in their life are willing to pay for it. I will be the first to admit that nearly all the time I spent with LEGO 2K Drive occurred before even the first of the drive passes, the Fast and Furious tie-in one, was released. But in the ongoing study of the game I conducted for this video, I did explore, though did not pay for, the four year one drive passes. And what I found was your standard games as a service type content pass, with some items able to be unlocked just through play and some unlockable only through play and the purchase of the premium drive pass. This means that every five levels of progress through your active drive pass unlocks something that can be used by the plebeian owners of the 2K Drive base game, but everything else is locked up tight behind the paywall. Obviously, the goal of giving you these free bits is to coax you into buying the whole pass, but I'm not falling for that trick. 
The additional multiplayer modes and new Stargaze Summit biome were introduced as part of these drive passes, but could be accessed without purchasing the premium drive passes, meaning that the only things meaningfully locked behind the paywall are cosmetic items. Bricks, drivers, cars, chassis, horn effects, stickers, flare, and despite the fact that this means I will never have access to the full garage unless I pay money, none of what I saw in the premium drive passes seemed worth the additional handful of dollars I'd need to part with to unlock them. That said, the garage is still a wildly robust tool, even without unlocking every single possible brick available to you. I was able to make this slightly incorrect approximation of Captain Redbeard's treasure chest convertible from LEGO Racers, uh, one of the old school coupes from LEGO City Undercover, Subpixel's own Musket, which only the truest of Subpixel fans will recognize, a newer, classier Subpixel hot rod, and the Killdozer. Though I do have one additional complaint about the garage, and that is that you cannot make your own chassis like you can with real LEGO parts. The rational part of my brain assumes this is maybe some programming hurdle that would have been too cumbersome to overcome, but the cynical part of me thinks that this was a deliberate decision in order to wring a bit more cash out of the microtransaction storefront. By only putting a curated selection of chassis into the game, and then putting some of them behind a paywall, maybe you'd get folks like me who had some very specific car in mind they wanted to make, but couldn't make it without one of the paywalled chassis, and thus would need to buy the part to make their car. I want to give Visual Concepts the benefit of a doubt, but all this stuff in Unki's shop makes it very difficult. But for the sake of intellectual exercise, let's talk about what kind of Drive Pass DLC I would pay for. In early 2022, Nintendo announced a booster course pass for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which claimed that it would, over the course of several updates, introduce over 40 classic Mario Kart tracks into Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I want this for 2K Drive. I want HD Desert Adventure Dragway. I want to play all the Xalax courses from LEGO Racers 2 in HD. Heck, toss in some of the LEGO Universe tracks in there. Give me the, the classic drivers and the classic cars. Give me that weird wizard from Stunt Rally. I talked in my LEGO 2K Drive trailer impressions video that it made sense as to why Visual Concepts wasn't pursuing a roster-based kart racing game because the LEGO group just doesn't really have a whole lot of first-party IP right now and so couldn't easily synergize 2K Drive with their physical sets. But there's a whole canon now of LEGO Racers characters and locales, both from the games and older physical sets, that could make for great DLC. It's unlikely the kids playing 2K Drive have their own money to spend on DLC, so they're going to have to convince their parents to buy this stuff for them. Why not then make that coaxing a little bit easier by asking the parents to pay for a Rocket Racer themed cosmetic pack. This is free marketing advice. Go buck wild. You will get my money if you put any HD LEGO Racers characters and courses into this game. So what then is my final verdict for LEGO 2K Drive? Well, despite every critical thing I've said here, I did have a lot of fun playing LEGO 2K Drive, and had a lot of fun re-exploring it in preparation for this video. The variety of things to do does muddle the flow of the game in my opinion, but it might be fine for you. It might be like David Masika hoped. We really tried to tap into the whole idea of it's your game, do whatever you want in it, play however you like, and that was one of our biggest challenges. But I think we did a really good job, and the open world is super engaging, super inviting, fun to look at, and fun to play in. And at least right now, at the time this video is released, LEGO 2K Drive is available on Xbox Game Pass, so if you want to try it, give it a go! Just know that, if you're a big LEGO Racers fan like me, adjust your expectations. It's not LEGO Racers, and it isn't trying to be. So lean in to what it is trying to be 
and maybe you'll enjoy LEGO 2K Drive as much as I did.